So about two weeks ago, a guy called Chrism released a video that performed 99% better than my own content, so I was intrigued, and considering Kaku had already done a similar video before, I thought, why not give it a shot? There were some takes in Chrism's video that I just completely disagreed with. And to play Widowmaker in GM, all you gotta do is really think about one thing, and that's your aim. Huh? So I thought I'd chip in myself. Let's get into it. And for reference, I will be formatting this around a tier list in order to make it slightly more easy to follow and easier to timestamp. This is also solely based on skill ceiling, which means how difficult a hero is to master. And I also used the videos from Sparlow and SVB on rating the roles between DPS, support and tanks. So don't get mad at me if I place a hero higher or lower than you expected, because I probably based it off them. Anyways, let's actually get into it. So at the very last place, we of course have Moira. I don't really think that this is a surprise to most people anyways. She has lock on aim, which makes the mechanical ceiling for her primary fire very limiting. Her orbs are also very easy to use at the highest level, as heal orbs are predominantly used. Fade is essentially a get out of jail free card, and the fade change is niche and isn't enough to raise Moira any higher. Her coalescence is also a piercing beam that's very easy to use and kill any backline squishies with it. So in total, the theory and mechanical skill of Moira is by far the lowest in the game. And as a result, she's the only hero in F tier. For reference, I love Moira. Like, I used to be a Moira OTP back in the day. I just think our hero design is trash. But hey, you can like trash like me, that's completely fine. Next up, we have Reaper. The reason why I put Reaper this low is because of the two-dimensional playstyle Reaper has. It's either he frontlines, which isn't very hard, or he flanks, which again isn't very intensive. All Reaper does is TP somewhere, land a few shots onto squishies, and uses his Wraith form back to his team. The only thing preventing him from going lower is that it's hard to land shots up close, as movement is exaggerated across your screen. Next up, we have Symmetra, who's a pretty one-dimensional hero. She's pretty much used in Brawl for TPs for mobility only, which are used to skip or bait rotations, for example Hanemura first point attack, or TPs are used onto enemy backline heroes, which again isn't very hard. The ceiling of Symmetra, even at the highest level, is to essentially live to just build a level 3 charge beam and beam down tanks, and that is basically Symmetra at the highest level. Not to mention turrets or TP bombs, which aren't really too skill intensive either. Next up we have Hog, a very one dimensional hero. Hooks are the main skill curve, but that's basically it. From a playstyle POV, Hog plays as a one man army in the highest levels, and there's nothing much more to him. Mechanically, he's a very simplistic hero with his hooks, not necessarily easy per se, but mastering and hitting over half your hooks isn't significant enough to raise the ceiling dramatically. After Hog we have Torb at 28th place. The only thing that keeps Torb this high are simply his left click projectiles. Every other part of his kit have extremely low skill ceilings. At the highest levels of play, where you should normally be playing Torb in anti-dive comps, such as the Orisa, Diva, Torb, Casti, Brig, Bap comp, he's very simple to play. Overload when dove, place turrets on flanks, right click up close, and use Molten Core to zone or punish a dive, and that's about it. And even Torb's left clicks can get a bit spammy and luck based sometimes. In 27th place, we have Mercy. Mercy is also the last hero to be featured in Eater. Mercy's skill ceiling may be argued as higher due to tech, but her overall playstyle and the nicheness of some tech reduces the significance of this, hence she isn't very skill intensive. Hard pocketing in DPS isn't very intensive, and tech such as Super Jump or Super Jump Res is becoming more and more common even amongst the lower ranks. She's not any lower, solely due to some min-maxing that Mercy can do, but I feel that's a cop-out to say that Mercy is more APM intensive than she actually is. Starting off in the D tier, in 26th place, we have Junkrat. Junkrat can be somewhat skill intensive the higher you go up, considering the Duelist playstyle that only the best Junkrats will master. However, that's about as far as it goes. The ricocheting of Junkrat's bombs and the ease of use with his trap and mines significantly lower his skill ceiling. In 25th place, we have Soldier. Now this might be surprisingly low, but I'll get on to explaining that. Soldier does require some decent hitscan aim and tracking, Helix certainly requires some skill to land, especially at the highest ranks, and playing against dive can be a challenge, again, certainly at the highest ranks. However, the reason why he isn't higher is solely because of his playstyle. At the highest ranks, Soldier just flanks from range, and that's about it. Soldier essentially plays as a hybrid between the flankers, for example Tracer and Sombra, and between the hitscan heroes, for example Casty or Ash. And flanking from range is typically very safe to do. Not to mention his ultimate, which I won't even get onto. In 24th place, finishing off the D tier, we have Orisa. Some of you may be surprised, and initially I would have put Orisa lower. However, the skill curve of Halt, especially post nerf with the smaller radius and faster speed isn't the easiest thing to get your head around. 
round. Not to mention, using supercharger against dive can be somewhat difficult, alongside the timing and placement of your shield. People often mix up skill floor and skill ceiling with Arisa, and I would agree that it does not take much skill to get any value out of Arisa, but that's referring to Arisa's skill floor. People need to get rid of the image in their head that Arisa just stands still, holds one button, and spams the enemy team. Because at the highest ranks, it really is more complicated than that. Starting off the C tier, we have Ash. Ash could be argued to have slightly easier aim due to the delay between our shots, which makes her easier to track. Not to mention, her abilities are quite simplistic. Bob is very easy to master alongside Coach Gun and Dynamite. However, positioning and aim saves Ash from going any lower. Next up is Hanzo, who is a very similar case of Ash. Hanzo has pretty easy cooldowns, for example, your Sonic Arrow, all you need to do is Sonic a flank and see if anyone's there, or with your spam bow or whatever that's called, you just sit on an off angle, activate your spam bow and spam the enemy team and they die essentially. However, the reason why he's higher than Ash is because his ultimate is slightly harder to use and his projectile is obviously harder to hit. At number 21 we have Bastion. Now before I get that angry comment saying that Bastion should be lower and he requires no skill, again, this is referring to skill ceiling, not skill floor. Yes, in bronze, Bastions will just sit main and go into their top form and spam the enemy team, but at the higher ranks, it's really not like that. The place that the Bastion is essentially forced to play is as a flanker, which is similar to Soldier. However, unlike Soldier, Bastion has no mobility, hence flanking is more easily punished, which means that it requires more skill and it has a higher skill ceiling than Soldier to be able to master that flanking. Also, tank configuration requires more skill than every single ultimate below Bastion right now. So it could honestly be argued that Bastion should be higher up, but the reason why he's not is because I find his kit to be very one dimensional, and if you master flanking, there's nothing much more you need to do. In 20th place, we have Zarya. Zarya of course requires a decent amount of mechanical skill, especially considering her beam and projector and in 2019, great Zarya players back in GOAT really showed off their excellent positioning and carrying teamfights. However, I would argue that's a bit more on the value ceiling side of things, rather than the skill ceiling side of things. I don't think it's very hard to master Zarya's positioning, and I don't think our bubbles are too difficult to use or too skilled to use. 90% of the time, even in top level play, you'll use both bubbles at the start of a fight to get 80 charge, and then what you'll do is keep your personal bubble as a get out of jail free card, similar to like a Cassidy flashbang for example, and with your projected bubble, you'll just put it on a Reinhardt whenever he swings, or whatever sign of aggression is coming from your team. Some people say that using bubble to peel is hard, but I digress. They're very situational, and you'll only really be using peeling bubbles when you already have high charge. So that's why Zarya remains at 20th place. In 19th place, we have Mei. Mei is this high up due to her very versatile wall usage, which even top level Mei still mess up, alongside the skill ceiling of managing to land icicles from afar. However, that's pretty much it to Mei's skill ceiling, and I could argue that Mei's wall isn't even that complicated. I've broken it down before in my acronym TLVCS, standing for timing, line of sight, verticality, clearing, and split or stacking, and I still use that rule when analysing top level Mei's. In 18th place is Brigitte. Now people need to understand that this is not 20 18 Brig. The best Brigs nowadays have to keep in multiple factors in mind. They have to threaten short sight lines, have good pack management, especially when playing low heal support comps such as Brig Zen. Speaking of Brig Zen, you need to make sure your rotations are as one, you need to make sure you're watching flanks, you need to make sure you're toning your aggression well on rally, and you also need to be making sure that you have at least one pack at all times for your Zenyata. The cognitive demands for Brig are a lot more than people think at the highest level. Each thing is not necessarily too hard on its own, and the mechanics aren't too hard due to the melee aspect, and Whipshot is really the only mechanical thing, and that's why Brig isn't going any higher than 18th place. In 17th place is Casty. Now Casty is very similar to Hanzo and Ash, so I won't spend too long on him, but the reason why he's higher is is because of the hard flanking playstyle, which is the peak skill ceiling for Cassidy in my opinion. Top level Cassidy's, such as Lethal and Contenders, or Carpe from the Philadelphia Fusion, master the greedy hard flank playstyle. However, close quarter combat isn't as intensive, and I don't think Cassidy's abilities are too hard to use. In 16th place, we have Reinhardt. Reinhardt is extremely game sense intensive, and whilst he does have lower mechanical requirements, he has to master the micro with positioning, shield usage, corner management, as well as being able to assess when to go aggressive or when to go defensive. You can see the skill in just people like Super or LH Cloudy, who have somehow who have somehow gotten main tanks, the most team-dependent hero, and one of the worst roles to climb with up until around 
1.6k. That alone should tell you the potential skill ceiling characters like Rhinot have. You mess up one bit of micro, and you're gone. However, due to Rhinot's limiting mechanics, he's not going any higher than 16th place. At number 15, we have Baptiste. Baptiste is a very APM intensive hero. His shoot shoot heals are decently hard to master, having a higher skill cap. He needs to lamp at the right time at the right place, having good reaction speed. And Amplification Matrix is something that differentiates top level Baptistes, not just using Matrix to zone and take space, but to also use it independently for yourself to deal damage on an angle which can be difficult. But the reason why Baptiste isn't any higher is because he's not very complex beyond the fundamentals. At number 14, we have Echo. Top level Echoes have picture perfect terrain management, managing to balance the use of cover to not get one shot, alongside the versatility of Echo's duplicate, and her primary fire can be quite hard to land in duels. However, Echo can be defaulted to a spammy hero even at the highest levels, and she can just poke tanks with stickies from off angles alongside beaming tanks, and this was quite common when Echo was being played against Winston. Not to mention, she has quite a big advantage over heroes such as Farah in aerial duels. At number 13, we have Sigma. Sigma is just a more advanced case of Brig. He's quite positionally challenging, he's got a decently high mechanical skill ceiling unlike Brig, having to consistently land primary fire beyond spam, and likewise the map can be APM intensive. The versatility of Flux and the playstyle of Sigma can shift according to which comp you're playing against and which comp you're playing with. For example, in the poke dive comp, you'd be wanting to play slightly more team oriented by wanting to rotate with your backline, whereas in double shield, you act more like your own independent force. In 12th place, we have Ana. Nothing about Ana's kit is really that easy. She has two different aiming styles, landing sleeps can be quite difficult, positioning even at the highest levels can be quite difficult as well, alongside having the skill ceiling of our nades and consistently landing them and getting value. However, each thing independently aren't too skill intensive, for example, needing on an off angle is not too hard, and compared to Zen who will obviously be higher up, Ana's positioning doesn't really get punished that much compared to Zen. Now entering the A tier, we have Farah. Farah is similar to Echo but harder to pull off due to having less mobility than Echo and slower projectiles. People like Yuzna really do show off how high Farah's skill ceiling can be. Barrage can also be difficult to use at the right time at the right place as well. However, what prevents Farah from going higher up is that our playstyle can become a bit dimensional at times and other heroes just have higher skill ceilings. At number 10, we have Sombra. The reason why Sombra is this high up is solely because of her fluid and flexible playstyle, similar to Tracer who will also be higher up. Her playstyle completely changes whether you're playing against a brawl comp, or whether you're playing against a dive comp, or whether you're playing against a poke dive comp, it completely changes and people like Lucid do show that in their videos. In terms of mechanics to her flanker counterparts, such as Doomfist, Genji, Tracer, she's not that mechanically difficult as she's more played at range, which really prevents Sombra from going any higher up. At 9th place, we have Lucio. Top level Lucios really do show the high skill ceiling of Lucio's mechanics, whether that be having perfect movement and perfect wall riding, or just managing to land 4 shots in close range, the height of Lucio's mechanical skill ceiling cannot be denied. However, looking at Lucio holistically, his playstyle isn't too complex, he's really just used in brawl and that's about it, there's not really too much you can do aside from contesting high grounds with D.Va and being within range of tanks to speed them. At 8th place, we have Zenyatta. It should really be no surprise to anyone that I put Zenyatta with the higher support skill ceiling. Slightly mispositioning at the highest levels can mean death, Orb usage on flanks can be difficult, for example, harmonying your tracer at the right time or discording their tracer in the duel. And the very best Zens can anticipate dives and keep that awareness and land damage on flankers before they engage and before they dove on the Zen. This isn't even to mention the reactionary transcendences, for example, using trance before the Rhinot shatters, or using trance before the Sombra EMPs, having good proper rotations with your Brig, alongside having a high mechanical skill ceiling with those 5 orbs. However, what prevents Zen from going any higher up is that sometimes he can be defaulted to being a very spammy sort of character, especially when playing the poke dive comp up against Brawl, even at the highest levels. At 7th place, we have Widowmaker. A lot of people just think Widow is point and click, just like I showed at the start, but this couldn't be further from the truth. The overwhelming majority of sniper duels at the highest levels aren't lost or won due to mechanics. Factors such as cover usage, infosight advantage, grapple jump shots, repositioning, utilising distractions such as friendly flankers, having a pocket or not, having high ground or not, and way more factors go into whether taking a duel or not was a good idea in the first place. Here's Spilo further detailing why Widow isn't just point and click. I mean, even if you didn't have a robot playing Widowmaker, there's a lot of decision making in terms of positioning, game sense, enemy cooldown usage. A lot of times, I mean, I've coached a lot of Widowmaker and like the Widow versus Widow duels, it's a huge, it's like a chess match. It's a big chess match. 
where you're peeking, when you're peeking, do they know you're there? Do they pre-scope? Um, should you grapple this if they know where you are? I think that's a, an added level of difficulty that most of it is just don't think about. A lot, a lot of lowering players is, oh, you just click heads. That couldn't be further from the truth, especially at the hiring. At number six, we have Wrecking Ball. This shouldn't really be a surprise to anyone. He's got a very unique movement set that only the best balls such as Yeetal can master. Not to mention, his playstyle changes up against every comp. For example, when going against a high CC comp, you would have to roll through them, whereas against a lower CC comp, you would be allowed to get a greedy slam on them. And something that people don't mention is what you actually do in the mid fight on ball. Yes, you roll through, yes, you slam, but what do you do after that? The reason why he isn't any higher is just the other heroes, I believe, have higher skill ceilings than ball. Now, entering the top five, we have Doomfist. Doomfist is very skill intensive to get any value. The endless amount of rollouts just automatically puts Doom in top five. Just watch any good Doomfist, such as Bandito or Get Quirked On, and you'll see what I'm talking about. However, his ultimate does have a relatively low skill ceiling, and Primary Fire has a lower skill cap than even heroes below Doomfist, such as Lucio, who have higher skill caps when it comes to their Primary Fire. Playstyle can also be an issue when it comes to skill cap, since at the highest level, in just Doom Rule, pressing W key and praying for the best is often what most teams do, believe it or not. Temporal, a professional coach, actually goes over how Doomfist is played into Brawl. At number 4, we have Genji. Genji's primary fire, similar to Lucio, can be very hard to consistently land. Not to mention, Blade is easily the top 3 most skill intensive ults in the game with the higher ceilings, just look at Necros or Cavalry or other top level Genjis. And Genji's playstyle can shift from a duelist to a diver to controlling angles to farm Blade as soon as possible. Nothing really prevents Genji from getting higher up, just other heroes with higher skill ceilings, whether that be their movement or their game sense. At number 3, we have Winston. Likewise to Genji, Winston has arguably the top 3 most mechanically demanding and skill intensive ultimates in the game, alongside his other abilities not being as straightforward as you may think. For jump pack for example, you may want to jump on certain high grounds or certain off angles to not take as much damage as you normally would, and with bubble, you can use it to split healing and transcendence or to prevent beat from hitting everyone in a grav. The sheer game sense that is required to play Winston at the highest level, alongside the mechanical skill from his ultimate, just drags Winston into a top 3 position. Only the top level Winstons will know how to play against really high damage comps, such as Echo Mercy for example, and that's partially why Winston didn't see it that much play a few months ago. But of course, Winston doesn't get any higher because his primary fire obviously doesn't have a high skill cap. At number 2, we have D.Va. Now when I actually posted my list on Twitter and on other discords in order to get some feedback, some people had argued that D.Va should be number 1. My response was that in terms of game sense, D.Va is probably the hero with the highest skill cap in the game. D.Va's mid-fight positioning and boost usage could always be improved, and her playstyle always differs depending on comp. She's played completely differently in Brawl to when she's played in Dive, and not only does her playstyle change between comps, but also within comps. For instance, when playing the Poke Dive comp, check out my guide on that by the way if you haven't already, you have to decide on D.Va whether you aid the dive from your Baller Tracer, or you look to peel for your own supports, and this depends on countless factors such as what your team are running and what the enemy team are running as well. But mechanically, D.Va is just less demanding than what's in a number 1 spot. So at number 1, if you've been keeping track, we have Tracer. Tracer is arguably the most mechanically demanding hero in the entire game. Her Pulse Bomb is arguably top 3 highest skill cap ultimates, even Overwatch League pros struggle hitting the Pulse Bomb consistently. Not to mention, your blink management, second to second tracking and mechanics, dodging and weaving, terrain usage and trigger discipline all factor into your standard Tracer gameplay, more than any other hero. Not to mention, Tracer's play style not only varies on a comp to comp basis, but also between teamfights. Whether you go for backline or not this teamfight, whether you go to mirror their flanker or not this teamfight, all come down to the status of your ultimate, the map you're on, and the composition you're running. I in fact recommend skimming through Sparrow's analysis of a 4.4k Tracer player and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's always something you can improve on with Tracer. So, that's my list. Please let me know what you think of the list down below. Do you think D.Va should be number one? Do you think anyone else should be number one? Do you think I should have put some heroes higher or some heroes lower? Do let me know down below. And if this video helps to raise your IQ, be sure to share it with your friends to also raise theirs. Until next time.